Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new and living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that never perishes, spoil, or fade. This is kept in the heavens for you. You who through faith are shielded by God, even though now you are experiencing suffering of all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold which perishes, even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you did not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Dearly beloved, a pleasant good evening to all the members of the family, friends, and comforters of the family. We are gathered here today to pay our final tribute of respect to that which is mortal of our loved one and friend. To you members who mourn your loss, we especially offer unto you our deep sympathies and on behalf of the Church of the Nazarene, on behalf of uh, our District Superintendent, Reverend Victor George, we want to express our condolences to all members of the family as well as from my family and of course, this here family of the Church of the Nazarene in Canaan. May we offer unto you the comfort afforded by God's word for such a time as this. Jesus said, this is a paraphrase translation, do not let your heart be troubled, trust in God, trust also in me. In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again or will come back to take you to be with me, that wherever I am, you may be also. Jesus also said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live, even though he dies. And whosoever lives and believes in me will never die. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we come into the sanctuary of sorrow, realizing our utter dependence upon you. We know you love us and can turn even the shadow of death into the light of morning. Help us now to wait before you with reverent and submissive hearts. You are our refuge and strength, O God, a very present help in time of trouble. Grant unto us your abundant mercies. May those who mourn their loss today, may they find comfort in your healing balm and in your sustaining grace. We humbly present these petitions in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So, of course, you have the program. So what we will do, we will, we will just follow the order of the service. And um, we have a prayer by Brittany Baptiste. Scripture reading by Egan Baptiste and the worship, call the worship, Sister Ola and team, and the tributes. We have uh, two tributes, and Cardilesi, I hope I pronounced that right, Paul and Rhonda Bristol, and then we have a special music by Ricardo Seals, eulogy by this is Lois Martino, and um, we have these moments of reflection in the word, and then we close and
proceed to the place of internment. So those of you who are to participate, um, stand by so we will not have to be saying at this time, at this time, at this time. So as, as the moment uh, the, a person exit the platform, you would take your place. Good afternoon, everyone. Can we all stand? Dear God and Heavenly Kindly Father, we thank you for this day, dear Lord. We thank you, dear Lord, that we are in the land of the living. In spite of the situation, dear Lord, I pray, dear Lord, that you will cover each and every one of us under your blood. I pray, dear Lord, that you will guide us dear lord as we go through this time dear lord i pray the lord that your will and your purpose we will be done in jesus holy and precious name amen, amen. This afternoon's scripture reading is taken from Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. Here begin it. To everything there is a season, and a time to every purpose under the heaven. A time to be born, and a time to die. A time to plant, and a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill, and a time to heal. A time to break down, and a time to build up, a time to weep, and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones, and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to get, and a time to lose, a time to keep, and a time to cast away. Here ended the scripture reading. Good afternoon to everyone. May I ask you to stand again, please, as we go into a time of song. If you have your sheets like this, the songs are on it. Victory in Jesus. I heard an old, old story, how a Savior came from glory how he gave his life on calvary to save a wretch like me and i heard about his groaning of his precious blood atoning then i repented of my sins and won the victory Sing, oh, victory, oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior for it. He sought me, sought me, and bought me with his redeeming blood. And he loved me as I knew him, and all my love is to Plunge me into victory beneath the panting. I heard about his healing, heard about his healing of his cleansing power. How he made, made the lame to walk again and cause the blind to see. Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow 
how Jesus came and brought to me the big sing of victory oh victory in Jesus my Savior Savior for him he sought me sought me and bought me with his redeeming sing he loved me he loved me ere I knew him and all my love is to him he plunged me into victory beneath the fencing sing of victory victory in Jesus my Savior forever he sought me sought me and bought me with his redeeming sing he loved me he loved me yeah I knew him and all my love is to him he plunged me into victory beneath sing I heard about a mansion and I heard about a mansion he has built for me in and I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea about the angels of the angels singing and the old redemption glow and some sweet
will be there when we get over yonder King Jesus will be there when we get over yonder oh won't it be a time? sing hallelujah time hallelujah time oh yes when we get over yonder hallelujah time when we get over yonder hallelujah time oh yes when we get over yonder oh Shout, sing and shout, and it's all about. Hey, hallelujah! Sing and shout, and it's all about. Hallelujah! Sing and shout, and it's all about. When we get over yonder, oh, won't it be a time? One more time, we'll sing and shout. Sing and shout, and it's all about. Hallelujah! Sing and shout, and it's all about. Sing and shout, that's all about When we get over yonder oh, Won't it be a time Hallelujah Put your hands together for Jesus
my ear, my hair, my body. So this is Kadesli Hall, uncle's favorite daughter and one and only daughter, and this tribute is from her. That fateful day. I cannot forget that fateful day. You have to leave, you went away. A sadness filled me up inside, emotions that I could not hide. Tears they came, sadness too. All my emotions just for you. Time would heal, so I was told, but time could never fill this hole. Here in my heart, there is a place. You're always there, keeping me safe. It's filled with love and happy times. It's never dark, your light it shines. In heaven now, you do reside to watch over me with love and pride. I know one day we'll meet again until we do just know how much I miss you and you are always with me, always. From Kadesli with love. And this one is from her mom and herself, when I lost you. I wish I could see you one more time, come walking through the door, but I know that is impossible. I will hear your voice no more. I know you can feel my tears and you don't want me to cry, yet my heart is broken because I cannot understand why someone so precious had to die. I pray that God will give me strength and somehow get me through as I struggle with the heartache that came when I lost you. Good evening, brothers and sisters in the Lord. Condolences to the family. I pray that the Lord will renew your strength. I hear the sound of a mighty rushing wind and it's closer now than it's ever been. The trumpet As Gabriel songs the call At the midnight cry We'll be going home When Jesus steps out on the clouds to call his children, the dead in Christ shall rise to meet him in the air. Thank you. 
will be quickly changed For at the midnight cry Yes, at the midnight cry For at the midnight cry When Jesus comes Thank you for the opportunity. Bonnie? Thanks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Bonnie, as he was affectionately called, was a close relative of my mother, Nyomi Guy Ni Barton. And his mother was my father's niece, which makes me a dual, a very close relative of Bonnie. I took note that he had AKA, of which none was Bonnie. And so I was thinking of the derivative of the name Bunny, where it come from. And I concluded that his second name, Bernard, could have been Bernie, Bernie. But because of our dialect or vernacular in Tobago, we call names to suit us in any particular way. And so I never knew him as Bernie, but Bunny. And that's the name we knew him by. So Bunny being a very close relative of mine was a very vogue or suave young man. What I mean, he could have dressed like his father, whom I knew. I knew him as a little boy. When I was a little boy, in fact. A well-dressed man. And Bunny came along like that. Until following his illness. I was not here when he was ill, but when I came back, I saw Bunny, and I said, I asked questions. And Bunny abandoned dressing up. You all agree with me? Yes, he abandoned dressing up. And became quieter and calm. Very calm. I took note of that during his latter years. So calm he had been that one could have emulated it and could still emulate it. A kind of calmness that befits our contemporary time, the present time in which we live. Being calm. We can all do with Bonnie's last days of calmness. He never called me by my name, Carlton. But would always say, Guy. Wherever. When I heard the way he would have pronounced it, even without looking, I could have said, Right, Bonnie. 
My wife and I, when we uh, granted him or gave him anything, he was very appreciative. What again he left with us? Manners. Bunny would always say, thanks. All right, guy, thanks. How many of us haven't received of the kindness of others? would return and say thank you. But he was like that during the last days I could say of him. And so with the passing of Bunny, he would have left legacies for us. Calmness and quietness and a display of manners. Good manners brought up sea. So today we lost our relative, a friend, a father, in Bunny. And we are thankful for the life he has lived and to have allowed us to interact with him. It has pleased the Lord to take him away before us. And so we still give the Lord thanks for being able to interact and live with him during the years he has been with us. I thank you.
Good evening, everyone. We thank you for being here with us in this time of our grief. We also thank those who are viewing online because we know due to the COVID, many people cannot assemble. But we give God praise and thanks for the great life of my precious brother. We continue to love him. John Bernard Barton, better known as JB's or 100, was born on August 9, 1956, to Catherine Batiste and Vincent Barton. John Bernard was the eldest child of our mother, Catherine, followed by Elvis Wallace, deceased, Richella Wallace, and I, Lois Wallace. Bernard was, the pro Bernard was the proud dad of one child, <laughs> Cadesley Hall. She meant the world to him. She was his pride and joy. Cadesley was the luckiest grandchild of our mother because she was the only one our mother was privileged to see, love, and give early morning walks before she died, before our mother died in 1981. I remember the smile and the proudness of my mother walking this baby out every morning. Praise God for the joy you brought to my mother before she departed this life. My mother was really proud of her son, Bernard. She showered him with such love. I would even say, I think she spoiled him. He in turn showed love and appreciation to our mother by obeying and assisting her in any way possible. Our mother was a single parent with a full-time job. As a teen, surprisingly, he seemed to have understood this because whenever she was on the 6.30 a.m. work shift. He would ensure we ate, bathed, dressed, and arrived early at school. He loved reaching early at school because he enjoyed playing with his friends before school started. However, even though he really loved arriving early at school, he never spank or curse us when we delay and shorten his playtime at school. My sister Richella vividly remember one day he took her school bag to help her walk fastly, but she liked carrying her bag. So she threw herself down on the road, kicking and bawling in real Tobago twang. Me want me bag, me want me bag. He tried calmly, as our cousin Carlton said, he tried calmly to explain to me, to Richella, but she did not care. So he just calmly looked at her and gave her back her bag. Obviously, his playtime was eliminated on that morning. Tobago in those days, I know, Big Brother would have put some good licks on her and snatch her up onto her feet. <laughs> but thank God. <laughs> But our brother Bernard was patient with love. Bernard loved dressing and looking good. He rocked one of the neatest Afro hairstyle of his days. He was surely a handsome dude. John Bernard attended the Bonacord Government Primary School. In fifth standard, he sat the common entrance examination. But in spite of his intelligence, he was not placed simply because Tobago did not have enough secondary school. So he had to remain in primary school and attended until seventh standard, standard seven. And there he did the school leaving examination. I guess his intelligence was now acknowledged as he was given his school leaving certificate. After completing primary school, he attended the Bonacord Trade Center and gained much knowledge in plumbing, in the plumbing course. 
On completion, he received the plumbing certificate. He was elated, but my mother was even more proud and elated of her son's achievement. Bernard loved cars, so my mom sent him to a garage right here in Canaan to learn about fixing cars. He excelled in straightening and welding. I was told he was very good at it. Because of his love for cars, he learned quickly how to drive, and therefore he gained his driver's license. Soon after this, one of our mom work colleagues gave him his used car. You can only imagine how Bernard felt to have his own car to drive. He was an avid tennis player. They were on a tennis team because on many occasions, our mother took us to watch him and his friend practice in the Crumb Point Court. Sister Erla, who is here, um, who was here singing, her uncle, Omil John, was one of the guys that there. Sister Rhonda, dad, Fitzroy Burnett, now deceased, he was also one of the guys. Um, along with his deceased cousin, Errol George. They look awesome in their white t-shirt and white short pants. Their clothing looks so white. It always caught my attention, along with their racket, which they love to pose up with for pictures. <laughs> my brother was born for greatness in this life. He had the love and support of our mother in every area of development he chose. One thing I remember, though, is that he was never interested in church during his youthful days. When we were invited to attend this church, he never visited or attend. And our mother never command or forced him to go with us. I guess she said, the church is near, so... Everything will be okay. He doesn't need to go if he does not want to go. Just now. Okay. So as a young adult, yet with good upbringing, the vices of the world was more enticing to him. Even though he was warned about certain effects of certain action, I guess he, w he felt he was a big man now. And he can try something. So he began smoking marijuana, had sex, partying, whatever he think. But unfortunately, some way, somehow, something affected his mental health. I remember as a child, every time after 12 a.m. in the morning, he always felt like going for a walk in the village. The streets were dark and lonely during those hours, but my mother could not get him to stay in door. So she would tell Richella, keep the doors locked. I have to follow your brother because I don't want car to knock him down or anyone to harm him. Praise God that somewhere during the walk, he was able to be persuaded by him to return home with her. Sometimes she seek help of our great aunt, Christiana Clark, who often look out for him as he passed by. And sometimes, many times, she was able to encourage him to come into her, her home until he was satisfied and ready to go back home with my mom. Praise God for the love of family, prayer, and medicine. He stopped going out in the dark of the morning for walks. He was more calm and usually kept to himself in his room. As time continued, he got closer to a normal life. But we knew, we knew, but we who knew him knows that was not meant, okay, just now, but we who knew him knows that this was not the life he was meant to live, but we accepted the new normal of his life. However, yet in this new normal mental 
held unstable state. He continued to practice many of the value installed in him by our mother. He was honest. Our mother taught us when we borrow, we must repay. When, we, when he would credit at my shop, he always repay when he got his welfare check. One day after paying me, he mentioned some other people he was going now to repay. I was amazed at the number of people who allow him to borrow money from them or gave him credit. I said he had to be a very good payer. So I was proud of my brother <laughs> that so many people trusted his honesty. Whenever he cooked, though it was more like an idol dish with buck, buck and things like that, he always asks when he sees us, you eat yet? I have some food here. You could come and get some. He always wants to make sure we all ate. I guess it was from his young days when our mother would tell him, make sure your sister get food to eat. Make sure they eat their food. Wow, that stuck with him, even in his mental unstable state. He began coming often in this church to special event the Bible club had. Our kids would invite him to get points for bringing people, or he will just come to see them perform. After a while, he began coming in the church service on and off without an invitation. He was now interested in church and God. He brought a Bible and many other godly books. He played lots of gospel music. He wrote God and God word on his ceiling. When he, when he lay down to sleep and he look up, he sees God on his roof, on his ceiling there. I am amazed. I thank God for, for him. He was being drawn closer to God, even in spite of the different challenges. Thank God. Now, two days before the fatal Thursday, my sister Richella was led by the Holy Spirit to remind him about salvation and salvation through repentance of sin. He listened and then he did the sinner's prayer of repentance. No one knew or even expected him to die that Thursday. But God loved him and ensured that he was given a final opportunity to really make it into heaven because his journey on earth was ending soon. We did not know, but God knew. Today, we are assured our brother is sleeping in peace because his spirit has gone back to God, our creator. Truly, we want to say, JBs, we love you in life, and we will forever love you even in debt. You were a wonderful brother to us. We would not have traded you for anyone else, even in your new normal state. You made us proud. You made your nieces, your great nieces, your nephew, your great nephew, your brother-in-law, which is also my husband included. Everyone talk about JBs with joy and happiness. So brother, continue now to sleep with God, our Father. Thank you, everyone.
Amen. Put your hands together for our life. Well lived. And uh, the different experiences that he had, the legacy that he left behind, and uh, of course, what is most important, or one of the most important thing that he has done in his life as Sister Lois highlighted was that he gave his life to Jesus Christ and that was the most one of the most important things that he did in his life so put your hands together for him once again So a pleasant good evening to all and those of you who may have coming during the proceedings and we want to express on behalf of the family the pleasure of you being here today. Let us quickly, let me quickly turn the attention to a familiar scripture taken from Second Kings chapter 20, I'll ask you to stand, and I know you can, for the reading of this scripture. So it reads as follows, in those days was Hezekiah sick unto death, and the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, came to him and said unto him, Thus said the Lord, said thy house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Then he turned his face to the wall and prayed unto the Lord, saying, I beseech thee, O Lord, remember now how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart, and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept so, and it came to pass, after Isaiah was gone out into the middle court, and the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Turn again and tell Hezekiah, the captain of my people, Thus said the Lord, the God of David thy father, I have heard thy prayer, I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will heal thee. On the third day thou shalt go up unto the house of the Lord. And I will add unto thy days fifteen years. And I will deliver thee and this city out of the hands of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. And Isaiah said, Take a lump of fig, and they took the, and laid it on the boil, and he recovered. Isaiah said unto Isaiah, What shall I, what shall be the sign that the Lord will heal me, that I shall go up into the house of the Lord? the third day. This is the word of the Lord. Father, we give you thanks and we give the praise. Your purpose be realized. In Jesus' name, amen. So we, have, we are here to pay the tributes of our final respects to Mr. Bernard, Mr. Bernard Barton, and uh, we have done that to some extent um, via the eulogy, of course, that tells us or reminds us a lot of thing about, things about him or some things that may be new to you, as well as the tributes, and especially that, of course, of Mr. Mr. Guy. So we have given our tributes or pay our final respects to him. A funeral service to me has three components. The first really is what we consider to be the celebration of the life of the person. And where we have, as I mentioned, the eulogy, where others who knew the person will speak highly of them and uh, 
it is said that we should never speak evil of the dead. And it is good to know that John lived a life. And it is interesting, Sister Lois gave us the, the entirety in capsule form of his life, the various phases of his experiences. And she did not um, you know, neglect to give those experiences that he had during his lifetime. So we have that. And the second thing is where we, in a funeral service, is where you seek to bring comfort to the bereaving family. And the third aspect, really, is where we issue a challenge. So t today we have done, of course, the eulogy, eulogizing the dead, speaking highly of the dead. And as Mr. Guy rightly said, what is left behind is the legacy he left behind. Sister Lois um, spoke about, of course, his, his kindness, um, his love. Um, Mr. Guy e expressed his sense of being appreciative and the sense of calmness. And these are qualities really to emulate in a person. So that is what we take away from this time being spent eulogizing the dead. We, he has left a legacy um, that we could follow certain area, certain characteristics that we should emulate. I would not go into um, in terms of trying to wrap your mind around it, but just to say we know that death is one of the most traumatic experiences in life. And um, people experience grief after one dies differently. Um, but we all feel that sense of loss. The degree to which you feel that sense of loss is always um, predicated on the fact that how close you are to that person and the relationship you had with that person. Some people, they are glad when you are gone. Um, you know, some people are sad when you are gone. If a person live a life where they give that person a lot of trouble, well, when you die, of course, it, it, it's a freedom for them. But if, you know, according to how tight the relationship is, of course, you will truly miss that person. Of course, people miss people for different reasons. People cry and funeral for different reasons. Some cry because the man owed them $10,000 and now they're wondering how in the world I'm going to get it back. <laughs> Who want to pay me? <laughs> and, um, so, you know, uh, but you have a lot of emotions that takes place during that time. But, you know, it, it tells us that when someone dies, how in this life we need to learn to appreciate them um, because they, they're not coming back anymore. And um, so live good while you're alive. But I want to challenge you today um, with this scripture. Um, it's a familiar scripture. And I will just take the subject um, or the topic from the very sad statement that the prophet Isaiah said to um, Hezekiah. He says, set thy house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. So I want to say to you this evening, set your house in order. So as we look at this text and we analyze it, what we will see, we will see, we will see what I will call an unwelcome announcement. The unwelcome announcement is that Isaiah came to the man and told him, you're going to die. I mean, nobody will ever welcome an announcement or a message or a messenger coming to you and say, you are going to die. Um, that is the most unwelcome announcement ever. As a matter of fact, every person wants to live. In the case, of course, of Hezekiah, we knew that this announcement meant that, as was revealed in the scripture, that he was, he was ill. And um, it said he was sick unto death. And we know that in this life, there are sicknesses that are unto death. And there are some sicknesses that are not unto death. Not all sicknesses will take you away. Um, but there are some, of course, when people are ill with such a sickness, they are more um, vulnerable or more close to, to death. 
Um, one person said, however, and I want to say, your sickness really don't kill you, you know. Um, sin is what God kills. The Bible says the ways of sin is death. If there were not any sin committed in the world by our first parents, Adam and Eve, then we will all, you know, live. And even though you are sick, you will still would not die. So you had this unwelcome um, announcement. <coughs> and what I will call... Secondly, what we will see, you have this, what we call an inconvenient truth. An inconvenient truth is found in the same statement. Because it said to him that you are going to die and not live. The inconvenient truth is that he will die. And that is what we will call a universal truth. The truth is, and is applied to us, is that we are all going to die one of these days. Death is inevitable. Death is a must. The only people who would not die, who will not taste that, are those who will be alive when Jesus, Jesus comes. But if, we, if Jesus tarries, we are all going to die. The statement also tells us that the death was imminent. It was very close because he said to him, definitely in the statement, you are going to die. So you are going to die meant that one, as I said, it is inevitable. You are going to die, that statement means that your death, in the, in the context of Hezekiah, your death is very imminent. Your death is very close. I don't know when you're going to die. All the Lord told me is that you are going to die and not live. And of course, we understand the text that he was sick. It says he was sick unto death. So it means that his death was very close. He didn't know when he would die, but the death was inevitable. And the same is true for all of us today. Every one of us here, if Jesus tarries, are going to die. Our death is truly inevitable. And our death is very imminent. The fact is that the moment you were born, you are dying. And the truth is that we are all given a certain time period to be on this planet. We all have a time of years in which we ought to be on this planet. Now, of course, there are those who will say we are, we are here for... Uh, the duration of 70 years and by reason of strength we will live a little longer but of course we know that people's lifespan has a lot to do with how, how you your lifestyle how long you live have a lot to do with how you eat how long have a lot to do with 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 with, with the, the 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 kind of exposure that you have in terms of certain chemicals is a lot of factors that involve in your your lifespan we know that people today live a little longer, they said. Um, but I observe that people were born in the 40s and in, the f in close to the 50s, most of them live about 85 years. Um, that, that seemed to be their lifespan. Most people were born in about the 50s. There are some, of course, we know who are, who are centurions, but people who live with, born within the 40s and sometimes in the 50s, they live up to about 85 years. So the truth is that Death is that inconvenient truth. It is something that we don't like to hear, we don't want to hear. It's not something that we, we, we're interested in hearing, but the reality is that we are going to die. And that death is not only inevitable, but death is imminent. So if you are a person who living a very unhealthy lifestyle, prepare to die. Um, prepare to die sooner than you, you should die. I am told that insurance companies, when they are evaluating you to see if you are fit to give what they will call an insurance policy, they ask you a lot of questions. They ask you about your family. They ask you, do you smoke? They ask you, where do you live? You live in the city or the country? Because all of these things impact upon the, how long you live. So if you are a drinker and a smoker, you may have to advise um, minus about five years. If you, if you live in the city, 
you have to add, add minus some years too because you are exposed to all the pollution and to all the noise. All these things impact upon you. And if you are ill, of course, you are, you are also closer to the grave. Those are the, the, the inconvenient truth. It is not that we want to hear. It is not what we like to hear. It is, it, we wish it could be different. But that is the reality. So in the case of Hezekiah, because he was sick, he said, listen, you are going to die and not live. Therefore, he said to him, set your house in order. Because an inconvenient truth, what, what is it it's about? It is a truth that when you accept it, it has to bring about a change in your life. It has to, it, it brings you to a place where you have to change your behavior. So in view of that, he told him that he need to take care of what I call, he needed to take care of unfinished business in his life. Hezekiah was a good king. You could read his story, he was a good king. But of course, it still did not prevent him from being at the point of death. So the prophet sent by God told him, listen, you have to set your house in order. And this really is the high point of the message today. Set your house in order. What does it mean to set your house in order? To set your house in order speaks about organizing your life according to priorities. It speaks about arranging your life according to a pattern. It speaks about putting first things first. It speaks about putting your life in the right sequence. Living the ordered life. We all need to set our house in order. There are those of us here today whose lives are out of order. You may think you are in order, but is it out of order? And there are those of us here whose life may be coming in order that we need to put in order. You know, if anything that is out of order leads to chaos, leads to failure, leads also to dissatisfaction. Everything in life seems to have an order. If you are a student, what is, what's supposed to be the order of your life? You have study, you have play, and you have, what, we, what I would say, same recreation. But you have study, you have play. Or you have books, you have, you have um, boys and girls, and you have play. What is supposed to be the order of your life as a student? Your first order, what's supposed to be in order is that your books are supposed to be the first place. Then, of course, play should be the second place. And looking for a boyfriend or a girlfriend is the last place. If you are about to marry somebody, you have to put your life in order. It means that you can't marry a woman if you don't have a place to put her in. You can't marry a woman unless you have a job in order to take care of her. So if you get married and you don't have a job and you have a place, your life is out of order. And that will bring chaos. The most stressful aspect of life today is people as far as finances is concerned. So when the man says, set your house in order, it meant that Hezekiah had some unfinished business. And let me just say to you what the order of life is. The order of life, let me just put it over here and then, then we'll put it in order. What is the order of life? Well, you have to set your relationship with God. You also have to have a good relationship with people. You also need to have a career. You also need to set your financial business in order. And you also need to set what I call your currencies of life in order. These are some of the areas that you need to put in order. So when he said, set your house in order, it means that Hezekiah, somewhere in his life, things were out of order. And it's like, you know, they give you some tools these days to assemble tables. Uh, when you buy tables long ago, you, you get it all together. You, you go to buy things these days, they give you a box, and they give you a plan how to assemble it. Now, you have to follow the instructions. If, 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 if you put something in the wrong place, and then you proceed to put some 
of, of your utility on that table, that table will collapse. So it has to be in a particular order. If you're cooking food, there are some food you have to put certain things before certain things. So if you're cooking soup and you, you, have, you, you have split pea soup and you put the, 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 the provision first, and then you look to put the beef after. What will happen? You will have a mess. That will be out of order. There's an there's a order in which those things ought to go. And similarly, your life as designed by God is supposed to have a particular order. And if that is not in order, then you will, your life, it doesn't matter what you accomplish in life, will be miserable. It doesn't matter what you do in life, your life will be dissatis dissatisfied. You will not have a satisfactory life. And even though you may seem to have achievements, you will really never have what is called full success. So you have to set your house in order. So some people have their life in this order. So the first order of life is not money. Is not finance another career. The first order of life is to be in right relationship with Almighty God. That's the first order of life. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes, let me hear the whole conclusion of the matter of life. He says we need to fear God and keep his commandments. So Jesus said, I know you have need of food and clothing and shelter, but he says, I want you to seek first. First priority, the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things that you need will be added unto you. And if your life is not, if, 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 as you live today, if Jesus is not your first priority or if you have not given your life to Jesus, your life is out of order. And I guarantee you, your life, in spite of what you possess, will be a life of misery and dissatisfaction. The second order of life is to love others, to be in right relationship with people. There are people who sometimes they, they say, well, well, I know God, but they don't live right with people. They don't have a right relationship with their husband. They don't have a right relationship with their neighbors. Um, some church people, they don't have a right relationship with people in the church. Your life is out of order. You have to put those relationships with people, you have to get those relationships right. As much as it lies in you, you have to live at peace. When they hurt you, you have to forgive them. If they, if, if they, if they treat you badly, maybe a neighbor who don't like your enemy, what the Bible says, if your enemy hungry, feed them. Be kind to them. But if you are cursing them, and there are church people like that, who believe, well, you see me, I have my God, me and my God. Well, listen, the Bible said, if, if you say you love God, and you are not in right relationship with other people, you are a liar. Because how could you love God who you have not seen? To love God is to love people, my friend. To love God means that you ought to be in right relationship with people. So you have to set that house in order. If you are a gentleman here today, and you have a child fathered by, by another woman, you have to take care of that child. You have to take care of that business. You have to make sure that that child, even though you and the mother don't talk anymore, even though the mother don't like you or the family don't like you, you have to take care of that child. That is the second order of business to live in right relationship with God. And, and also the first order and then to live in right relationship with people. Then of course, you need to have, a, of course, your career, that is important. Have a job that's important in life. To work. Work is not just about making money. Work is about making your contribution to society. Work is about making your contribution to other people. And work is about also make, helping yourself to live a life of, of, of comfort. But work is important. And of course, you have that career. And then you need to take care of your financial business, of your finances. You have to set your house on you know, some people have their work, but they don't manage well. You have even Christian people, they don't manage their business well. What you do with your money? I, I love the biblical principle of agriculture. When a man, what, what you do with your money? You do about four things with your money. When you get your pay, 
you give some to God. When you get your pay, then you put some, you, you invest some for yourself. When you get your pay, you also give some for, you also in, give some other people. You also need to invest it with, in, give, give to other people. In the Old Testament, this was an agricultural practice. When you got a, your fruit from the land, the principle was that you give the first fruit to God. Then you will keep something for yourself because you have to plan back. It's a simple principle, you know. People tell you, oh God, you can't take any money for nothing. It's a simple principle. You have to put, you, have, you must, if you, are, if you are a farmer, you have to keep some good, some good seeds to plant back again. So what it means that you keep some for yourself, that is what you will reinvest. And then you, you eat some. But then the Bible says, you see, those that fell while you're gleaning or while you're reaping, don't take a bat. Leave that for the poor. He said, you see the ends, the edges, don't take that. Leave that for the poor people. So what do you do with your money? Your money is not for you alone to eat everything. You know? Your money is designed to help you and your family, of course. But you have to give some to God. If not, you're out of order. You have to give some to God. The first belongs to God. Then you have to keep for yourself. Invest in UTC. Invest if you are children. Let me, you have to set those things in order. A lot of people are out of order. No wonder why after sometimes when somebody die, they like the song Papa was a rolling stone. Wherever he laid his heart was a home, his home. And when he died, all he left us was, was alone. So you have to put something in place for your children. Don't study these foolish people. Invest in insurance. Uh, go to UTC. You have children. They're, they're young. Go to Unitrust. Open something for them. All these like little children like these. If you're, not, if you're not doing it yet, take something so that when they reach 12, to, when they reach 14, 15, they already have money. This is what some of the other people of the different diaspora does. I'm not a racist. But you wonder why some people progress in life? Of course, it's the law is living in the U.S. of A. My mother, lived there, my mother lived there a long time and she woke among Jewish people. Jewish people. And Jewish people, they know how to invest so that the, you invest for generations to come. Your children, children, you have to invest for them. That's why I have some people, you always wonder how they are progressive and how we people always see in trouble. It's because we have failed to set that in order. You have to set your financial portfolio in order. When I was uh, uh, I left school, I had a friend who was insur in insurance. He came to me one day, he said, cut you up with the financial portfolio, boy. He said, this is, you, you, have, you have money um, in, in insurance? I said, no, I have none. He said, you have money in this, in this special scheme? I said, no. And he was able to put me and, and, and help me to do those things that I need to do so I can invest in the future. You have to, you have to set those things in order. Set your financial portfolio in order. But don't forget that you have to give something to God. Now we tell young people, for example, when you get your first job, especially if you're still living by your mother, when you get your first pay, give all, if, if, if you are Christian, give all to God. Give all to God. That's your first fruits. Now, when you get your second pay, you give the percentage to God, and then you see your friends, you're having a big celebration. Big celebration. Thank God for giving you the job. So you, you, you're inviting this one. I mean, you're buying. I mean, you're maxing out everything. Yes, you do that. Max out everything. Make sure I give your mother some money too. There are children who are living in their mother's house. They don't pay. They don't give nothing. You live in there. You have to give something. You have to give something. So... Have a big party because let me tell you what that's the last big party you have like that. Because after that, of course you will give to you will give to people. But always walk with some money, extra change in your pocket. Always walk some extra change in your wallet. So when a fella need, when when a fella who is genuine who needs some stuff, you say, boy, a hungry boy, you say, all right. Or sometimes you have to buy it for them because you deal with them according to knowledge. But you have to set your house in order, and then. You have to invest. Where, where will you invest your talent and your time 
and the currencies of life. All the talent that God has given to you. All the gifts that God has given to you. Where do you invest that? You have to invest your time in people. You have to invest your talent, of course, to help people. You also have to invest your influence. Everything that God has given to you. These are what is called the currencies of life. And so, this is how you put your life in order. So when the man says, set your house in order, he was talking about a totally integrated, it's not just about making your life right with God, that is first priority, but it's about all the other things that you need to do with your life. How you need to put it in order. So I say to you today, if you don't know Jesus, you need to put that in order. If you're not living right with people, you need to set that in order. If you are not practicing investing you need to put that in order if you are not in if you are not taking care of your financial portfolio you need to put that in order set that in order thank you Sir Dash. set that in order because you are going to die and not live so the final thing that this statement also suggests is what we call the urgency <clears throat> the urgency of the now because when he said that, made that statement, he was not talking about set your house in order tomorrow. He spoke to him about now. He said, set your house in order right now. So the statement is also urgent. Urgent statement. So today, like Hezekiah, if you don't know Jesus, you have to set that house in order. If you are slack on the other areas of your life, you also have to set that in order. And you have to do that now. In terms of Jesus Christ, you have to do that now because tomorrow may be too late for you. Tomorrow may never come for you. Or tomorrow, your heart will be too hard to accept Jesus. Now, see those three statements I, I mentioned there? You have to understand how critical that is. When he said, set your house in order. Put your life, make sure your life is right with God. Make sure things are right with other people. And of course, do the others. It, it speaks about the fact that you have to do it now. Because you, you don't procrastinate. Don't put it off because tomorrow may never come for you to do that. There are many people today in hell who wanted to live for God, who had great desires, who will say, you know, well, not now, next week, next year, and then the time never came. I know of a young lady many years ago when we proclaimed Jesus, well, as I live in the Southland, she always said, um, after, after Christmas, after Carnival, well, you know, she died without accepting Jesus. And there are other people because of the fact that it's, it's, you never know when your life will be cut short. Secondly, tomorrow may, may be too, your heart will be too hard to accept God. Now let me tell you a story. You, you, you may not understand that. You may not, you may not hear much about that. But if you keep on resisting Jesus, there comes a time when you cannot accept God, you know. The Bible says, do not harden your heart. You know what that means? Let me show you what that means. If the first time you ever cut grass in your life with a cutlass, or the first time you ever do manual work, you see all your hands, that's so fun. So I get bladder, water, bladder, corn. The first time you ever walk on, on hot asphalt, it will burn your foot or burn your feet. But as you continue to walk on it, your foot becomes hard, callous to that. Your hands become callous to that. You don't feel it anymore. Anytime you are in the presence of God and a message spoken to you, when you resist it, don't think you're leaving the, the presence of God the same. You are leaving it as a hardened person. And there comes a time when you have no desire for God. 
it, you, because it comes like nothing to you. It, it doesn't. It, you, don't, you don't feel that conviction anymore. And that is where it is dangerous. That is why it is urgent for us to give our life to Jesus. That's why it's urgent to make sure our life is in order. Make sure that things are set in order. So, this urgency is for the now. Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Remember now thy creator, it says, in the days of thy youth. Not tomorrow. So, I want to make the urgent plea. It was very good that Mr. Bernard according to Sister Lois, based upon the moving of the Holy Spirit of her sister, when she came and spoke to him, not knowing that he would have been deceased a few days after. And thank God that he still gave his life to Christ. Because there are people who feel that when you're about to die, you're going to give your life to God. And I'll tell you this story and close. There was a guy that called Francis of Assisi. Many of us have heard about him. And he was in a community where there was this man who was sick and at the point of dying. The people told Francis, you know, go and pray for the man. You'll accept the Lord. Francis said, no, nah, he wouldn't do it. They found that very strange. Because you believe when a man about to die, he going to accept God. The truth is that when he went to pray, the man, the man said, to him after asking him do you want to change your life accept Christ he says no and he's spitting in the man's face and he died there comes a time my friend when there is a line we cross you know when God calls you you have to come it, it, it is not, it's, it's not when you want to come it's when he calls you you have to come and, and when God speaks to you, and maybe there, were, there are some of you here today whom God has been speaking to over and over and over for many years for about things that you need to take care of and finish business. You have to take care of those things because if you continue, there comes a time when you really have no desire to serve God. And if there is no desire, you could never ever um, accept Christ as your savior. So, I want to encourage you today to set your house in order, whatever that means to you. If you have to take care of your financial business, I have to take care of that now. If you have to take care of your family or, 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 or be in, uh, living on, on good terms with your neighbors or with your members of your family, do that now. But above all, if you are not, if you have not given your life to Jesus, you need to do that now because you are going to die and not live. I love to look at these um, bottles of water. I'm looking to see it here now. But in every yes, every, you, it may be hard to see it, but over the blue water sign, you will see BBE 15 of the 2nd, 2024. It means best before and there are some things where you have expires Let me see this one. and some things where you have the expiry date so the expiry date means that when that time come that thing is no good anymore throw it away it might still be tasting sweet but it has no nutrition in it Best before, I remember I saw, first time I saw it was on a tin of carnation milk. So, I, I was kind of confused because I wasn't know if best before and expired mean the same. Some people are thinking it means the same, it doesn't mean the same. So what I did, I called the company in the US. I said, explain to me. I see best before. Does best before mean expired? She says, no. She said, best before means that after this date, it wouldn't have the same taste. It will have the same quality or nutritional value because it, 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 was, it is best 
at that time you ever go by places and you buy the same food and one time at the peace station go the next time the peace station all this the, the, it was it was it, you see that time they gave you the one that was bbe so after the 26 it, 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 it has no additional value people are, you know be careful we used to cater you see all them ketchup and things people go and buy thing that is best best after you know not good after you know so you find it don't taste as nice. You see, how we sing this and so? It's like buying, going by the by by store and get or by uh, by the swallows and get fresh fish, and you have fish in the ice for one year. It doesn't taste the same. You see, so what does that mean? Your life is best before. It is it is best for you to give your God your life when you're young, when you have health. When you have strength, when you have vitality, it is wickedness for any person here to say, when I get old and I have it, I will give my life to God. It's wickedness. If somebody gives you a dog with no eye, no teeth, one foot, you will take that dog? You will say, boy, am I insulting me? But you want to give your God your life when everything is gone. When you have no strength anymore is wickedness so give your life to god now and like the spy date is when poof you disappear you have an expiry date you know, all of us here we just don't know when it could be tomorrow it could be two years from now it could be three years from now but all of us are sitting in the departure long waiting for the flight flight 565 to new york this is Alois. And you, you can run how much you want, but don't frighten. They're still catching you. So, right now you are best before. Because you're here with, you, I'm seeing you. For those of us who are hearing via the, the, the media the, of, of Facebook or YouTube, you are best before, right now. So now is the best time to give your life to God. And don't wait until you expire, because you just can't. So set your house in order, my friend. For you are going to surely die. That is inevitable. And not live. Set your house in order. Let us pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we give you thanks and we give you praise. We thank you, Lord, for your love. We thank you for your mercies and grace. We pray, O oh God, that as we have come into the sanctuary of sorrow, that you, O oh God, will help us to take those qualities from Mr. Bernard's life, Barton life. Those qualities that were said of quietness. Those qualities of being appreciating, appreciative of stuff, what people have done for us. Those qualities of always paying back what we owe. Those qualities of, of being a kind soul. Those are the things we want. And above all, we all want to remain safe and safe as he have accepted you as his Lord and Savior. And so this, though this evening as we are about to leave this place, we pray for the members of the family. We pray, O oh God, that you will give them your strength. You will give them your grace, especially the daughter and other members of the family and persons who are very, very close to him. Be, be their comfort. Meet them as only you alone can. Give them your peace in the name of Jesus. Give them the, the, and, and may they rejoice in the assurance, most important, that he is in the presence of God. When some people die, the priest or the pastor or the pundit try to comfort them with words that he knows is not true. But Lord, we thank for the truthful testimony that this man has made his pathway right with God. So in as much as he has done so, we rejoice today that he has gone to be with God. And may the family find comfort in those words according to Paul because he is in the presence to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But Lord, those of us who are alive here today, Help us to make 
our heart right with you. Help us to be in good relationship with people. Help us to learn to forgive those who hurt us. Because your word said, if we don't forgive people, you would not forgive us. And sometimes we forget that reality. And Lord, help us to live in love, even with those who don't love us. Even with those who want to hurt us. Help us to set those things in order for our lives. And for the young and those who probably need to, who are, who are so caught up in all the different things of life, help them to set their house in order. Help them to know you, to serve you, and to deal well with their finances, to invest well so that their future will be bright and they will be able to help somebody along life's pathway. So, Father, whatever it is, whatever the need is here today, whatever unfinished business that needs to be taken care of, may we do so. In Jesus' name, amen. The man indeed. God bless you, my friend. So we have the closing hymn, and then we make our way to the cemetery. Now, I don't know if... Um, do you want to open the coffin for a final view? So we'll ask the attendant um, to do so. But before we, before we, we do that, we, often, we always take an offering, not for, the, not for the church, but to help people who are in need, and especially this time of COVID-19. Um, so whatever you could give, you could give as the ushers pass, and you would be able to share what God has blessed you with. So we will ask the attendant after they, they do pick up the offering to come and open the coffin and we will come down the middle and exit on the side. So you come down the middle, view the body and, and go on the side. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more, when the morning breaks eternal bright and fair, and when the saved of earth shall gather over on the earth, can you stand with us, please? It's called up yonder. I'll sing when the roar is called up yonder. When the roar is called up yonder. When the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, swing on that bright and cloudless, on that bright and cloudless morning when the dead in Christ shall rise and the glory of his resurrection share. Oh, when his chosen one shall gather to their home beyond the skies and the roll is called up yonder, swing when the roll, when the roll. Is called up yonder. Oh, when the roll is called up yonder. When the roll is called up yonder. When the roll is called up yonder. Let us labor. Let us labor for the master from the dawn till setting sun. Let us talk of all his wondrous love and care. Then when all of life is over and all work on earth is done And the roll is called up yonder Swing when the roll, when the roll is called up yonder 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 When the roll, roll When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more And the morning brings eternal bright and fair When the saved of earth shall gather over on the other side When the roll is called up 
shall rise and the glory of his resurrection share when his chosen one shall gather to their home beyond the skies and the roll is called up yonder Son. Let us talk of all his wondrous love and care. Oh, then when all of life is over and all work on earth is done, and the road is called to be under.
Testing, testing. I know my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand upon the earth and after my skin has been destroyed yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes. I am not another. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. Then the saying that is written will come true, death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thank God for our Lord Jesus Christ who gave us the victory. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. Because you know that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Then I heard a voice from heaven say, Write, blessed are the dead that die in the Lord. From now on, yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labor and their deeds will follow them. Let us pray. For as much as the spirit of our departed loved one has returned to God, God who gave it, we tenderly commit his body in the grave in short trust and certain hope of a resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. That life and resurrection is through our Lord Jesus Christ, who will give unto him a new body, like unto his glorious body. Blessed be the dead that die in the Lord. O Heavenly Father, God of all mercies, we look to you in this moment of sorrow and bereavement. Comfort these dear ones whose hearts may be heavy and sad. We will look to you to guide us and sustain us in the days to come. Grant, O oh Lord, that they may love and serve you and that they may obtain the fullness of your promises in that world to come. May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant, who brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, may he equip you with everything good for the doing of his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing in him through our Lord Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. So in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit, we eternally commit his body to the grave from thus thou art to thus thou shall return. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust.
passata scelta che se non c'è suona lui mi vuole che la gente ah no se non è nella vita fa figlio
Bye. 
Thank you.